Hello to all and good evening. My name is Alyssa Storr, and I am the 1998 Women's Week co-chair and one of the Sexual Assault Awareness Coordinators with the Margaret Sloss Women's Center here on campus. Before I begin my introduction of our speaker tonight, I would want to announce all the sponsors that made Women's Week 1998 possible. African American Studies, Agronomy, Athletics, Architecture, Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics, the Colleges of Agriculture, Business, Design, Education, Engineering, Family and Consumer Sciences, Liberal Arts and Sciences, and Veterinary Medicine, Civil and Construction Engineering, Classical Studies, Committee on Lectures, Curriculum and Instruction, Dean of Students Office, Economics, Foreign Languages and Literatures, Health and Human Performance, Human Development and Family Studies, GSB, Landscape Architecture, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender and Allies Alliance, Microbiology, Minority Student Affairs, Panhellenic Council, Parks Library, Philosophy, Political Science, Psychology, Religious Studies, Sociology, Statistics, I'm almost done, <laughs> Program for Women in Science and Engineering, Women's Studies, YWCA of Ames ISU, United Christian Campus Ministry, thanks Rev Bev, the 1998 Women's Week Committee, my co-host Tara Wood, who's down here in front, my wonderful and supportive colleagues at the Margaret Sloss Women's Center, and last but not least, my family and friends. Please do not forget to visit the information tables in the lobby. The Margaret Sloss Women's Center, Choice USA, Hughes Magazine, and the Ad Women Campaign will be featured. There will be voter, voter registration tables also um, in the lobby, and we will also have voter registration and absentee ballots in the union tomorrow from 10 to 4. There will be a reception for Gloria and a book signing at the Brunier Gallery in the Schumann Building following tonight's lecture. You may purchase your books upstairs in the main lobby after the lecture, and then you can head over to the Brunier Gallery. I would like to personally dedicate this night to three women who hold a special place in my heart and have shown me what really matters in life. You may recognize the names of these wonderful role models. My mother, Jan Storr, my grandmother, Catherine Peet, and the late great athlete, mother, and businesswoman, Florence Griffith Joyner. Now, it is with extreme honor and pleasure that I introduce our speaker for tonight. A devoted writer, editor, lecturer, and activist, Gloria Steinem is undeniably one of the most important leaders of the modern feminist movement. Inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame in 1993, Ms. Steinem is recognized for the transforming effect of her work, and she continues to speak eloquently and sensibly on human rights. In 1956, Gloria graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Smith College. She then lived in India for almost two years as a Chester Bowles Asian Fellow where she wrote for Indian publications and was influenced by Gandhian activism. Currently, Gloria is a writer and consulting editor for Ms. Magazine, an international feminist bi-monthly that she co-founded in 1972. Included among her books are Moving Beyond Words, Revolution from Within, A Book of Self-Esteem, and Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions. Her writing has also appeared in New York Magazine, a weekly she helped found in 1968, and served as political columnist of until 1972, and in many other magazines, newspapers, and anthologies, nationally and internationally. As an organizer, Gloria Steinem helped to found the Women's Action Alliance, a national center which provides non-sexist, multiracial children's education and communication among women's groups, the National Women's Political Caucus, and the Coalition of Labor Union Women. She is president of Choice USA, formerly Voters for Choice, 
an independent, bipartisan political action committee that supports candidates working for reproductive freedom. She is also the founding president of the Ms. Foundation for Women, a national multiracial women's fund that supports grassroots projects to empower women and girls. Her honors include numerous journalism and humanitarian awards. Gloria was also named for nine of the 10 years, the World Almanac listed the 25 most influential women in America. Now sit back and really listen to what our speaker has to say. You may be surprised. It is now an extreme honor and pleasure to introduce one of my role models, Gloria Steinem. Look at all of you out there. Who says this is a conservative place? <laughs> Are we going to have a good time tonight or what? <laughs> Thanks uh, to the fact that each of you has been generous enough to take time out of a busy life and come here tonight, we have something very precious, which is an hour or so together in this room. So here's my plan. If all goes well, each of us, me included, will leave here with some new idea, some new feeling of support, some new subversive organizing tactic. Uh, <laughs> and in order to make that happen, I need your help because we're here as we have to be in this size group with you looking at each other's backs and me looking at you. I mean, this is a hierarchical form. Hierarchy is based on patriarchy. Patriarchy doesn't work anywhere anymore, at home or on this campus or in this room. So what I'm hoping is that during what's usually called the question and answer period, uh, you will help me to overturn this structure and turn this more into a group that could be sitting in a circle and learning from each other and seeing each other's faces. So I, I hope that you will feel free not just to ask questions, but to give us answers. We could all use some answers to stand up and make organizing announcements of upcoming troublemaking meetings you think this group should know about, to stand up and say where the bodies are buried locally, if you'd rather not say it yourself, you can pass me a note. I'm leaving real early in the morning. I'll say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and truly to turn this into an organizing meeting. Maybe I only see when I come the best people in Iowa, but I have this very skewed picture of how terrific Iowa is. And when I was sitting in the airport after I arrived and reading the newspaper, seeing on the, on the front page or on the front sections of the Des Moines Register uh, a piece about a women's prison in which women are allowed to have their children and raise their children, something that we've been struggling for in New York State and other states and have not yet achieved. Leaders of the church uh, coming forth to ask uh, to create a movement uh, to honor gay unions, uh, gay marriages. Uh, I noticed that uh, Roxanne Conlon has got a great client again there in a, <laughs> in a sexual harassment suit it's in a restaurant in Des Moines. I mean, you know, the, I thought, you know, how, how, how dare New York think? You know, they, New York has this, this vision, you know, that, that folks in Iowa are somehow behind. I would like to take you to New York and give Giuliani a lesson or two. And uh, <laughs> um, so um, I'm really looking forward to this um, organizing meeting because that's the best part for me. Then I get to learn something too. And before I, I uh, uh, you know, begin to talk a little bit about the subject of the politics of feminism and celebrating diversity. I also wanted to say a word or two about 
ways of expressing our diversity and celebrating uh, that are going to be more available to us, I hope, because we were here tonight. For instance, there is a voter registration campaign going on, and I understand there's a voter registration in the lobby. And we should, uh, I think, get mad and vote because we should remember that this country makes voting more physically difficult than any democracy in the world, still. I mean, even in Canada, two people employed by the government come to every household to make sure that you're registered. And they post in the neighborhood, you know, those who are registered or not. In, in India, with all the problems of uh, illiteracy and poverty that India must contend with, 70% of the eligible electorate votes because they keep the polls open for a week. Here we don't even, even let people off work for a day. So I think we need to face the fact that there are still forces that are trying to keep the voter turnout low because then those with the money and sometimes the church buses and you know to turn out the vote can triumph. And I've, I myself have only realized lately um, that in my lifetime, the psychological arguments against voting, that is, politics is dirty, your vote doesn't matter, the candidates are just alike, all mysteriously arose just as the civil rights movement had courageously and at risk to life and safety knock down the last physical barriers to voting. There's a reason why those psychological ones are out there. I mean, I went back to look at the um, Nixon-Kennedy televised, the first televised presidential debate in 1960, uh, because I kind of remembered in retrospect that Nixon had been pioneering the, oh, these candidates are just alike, it doesn't make any difference argument by presenting himself as exactly the same as Jack Kennedy. And sure enough, there he was. There's Richard Nixon saying, yes, the senator and I really agree. It's just a different method, you know, method for getting there, but we really are equally concerned about old people and so on and so on. Meanwhile, of course, saying, while, while suppressing the general vote by uh, subliminally saying that uh, the candidates were not that different, really working very hard to get out very specific special interest uh, conservative voters. And generally, as you know in this nation, it is the well-to-do, the older, uh, the more powerful groups in the nation that benefit from a low voter turnout. So I, I really think when we hear ourselves saying, if we hear ourselves or our friends saying, politics is dirty, the vote, you know, our votes don't matter, you know, the candidates are just alike, we ought to think who's talking through us and really say to ourselves, look, voting isn't the most we can do, no, but it is the least. And this upcoming election is the most important election in my lifetime. This election will spell the difference between we're on the edge of becoming a non-participatory democracy. We could have as few as a third of the eligible electorate making the decisions for us. This election will decide whether uh, a president is impeached or not. Not, not the merits of whether he should be impeached or not, as we've seen by the current debate in Washington, but the question of who is in the majority uh, in the House and the Senate. So I hope we get mad and stand up and say people died for this vote and we're definitely going to use it. Secondly, um, I've been here for a lot of Equal Rights Amendments events of various kinds, federal amendments, uh, the federal amendment usually. So I'm glad to see that now you are about to add women to the Constitution. Um, and 
Um, I, I also want to say a, a word about the use of the word feminist, since uh, the politics of feminism is in this evening's title. And I know that there are still, or perhaps increasing difficulties with that word because it has been demonized. Uh, just like affirmative action, liberal, you know, words that were becoming too effective and beginning to change the power structure began to be demonized. So maybe I ought to say one more time in case, and I'm always hoping there's people, people who might have come here for the, to hear a feminist talk for the first time. It walks, it talks, it's a feminist, you know. <laughs> that, the, that the word uh, has problems for, I think, two general reasons, kinds of reasons. One is that people don't know what it means. And they think that it means, um, you know, man-hating or difficult or, I don't know what, people who believe in female su superiority instead of equality, all kinds of things. And if you just go to the dictionary and see that it means a person who believes, a person, male or female, men can and should be feminist too, who, uh, who believes in the full social, economic, political equality of males and females, then a lot of people will say, oh, okay, I believe that. And there's a huge difference in the response in public opinion polls between those polls that ask the question with the definition and those who ask the question without it. I must say, though, that even those that ask the question without it, more women self-identify as feminists than as Republicans. So the question is, compared to what? You know, they never tell you the compared to what part. And feminists turn out in those polls, even without a definition, to be more respected than lawyers. But <laughs> the, um, the second problem with the word feminism, though, is that people do know what it means. And it does mean a deep, enormous, transforming change. Because we do have a structure which is based on the bifurcated notion of human qualities falling into masculine and feminine instead of thus depriving both women and men of our full range of human qualities. Um, and we do have uh, a system in which sex is the most basic division and in some ways provides the anthropological model for uh, race and class and other divisions. Power is by no means equally distributed. So we do have to face the fact that it is going to get opposition. And if it's sincere opposition to its real content, that makes sense. This is a revolution, not a public relations movement. And I hope that th those of us who do believe in equality, whether we're women or men, will not allow anybody else to take our word away and fail to get each other's support, you know, and become people who say, yes, I believe in equal this and that and the other thing, but I'm not a feminist, which leaves each person isolated with their beliefs instead of identifying in a way that brings you support and brings community and brings other people who, who share that belief. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, we live in a, in a day in which words are being words and concepts are being uh, distorted. Think about affirmative action, which actually, uh, wherever it has been properly applied, has raised the standard, not lowered it, has increased the pool of talent, is for the good of the nation so that more talent can rise to the surface. If you, if you consider that the old way that we have been uh, choosing our leadership in many areas was to first eliminate all the women, that's more than half, then all the men of color, then everybody who hasn't been able to purchase a college degree. I've, I've forgotten what, I think you end up with about 6% of the country and you haven't even started on inherited wealth yet. You know, so obviously we need affirmative action to reach out and to raise standards. But we see how that phrase has been perverted. 
And I fear that now sexual harassment is being perverted as a phrase too, because the same right-wing groups that opposed tooth and nail the sexual harassment law. I mean, Phyllis Schlafly got up in Congress, for instance, among many right-wing leaders, and testified against sexual harassment laws, saying that if women dressed properly and behaved like ladies, they wouldn't have this problem. But now that those same groups are trying to use it to peacefully assassinate a president, e even though the president handed them the weapon, let's face it, but still, the, um, the, there, I, what worries me, I mean, s separate from the question of Clinton for a moment, who will be gone in two years anyway, I'm concerned about the endurance of sexual harassment law, which we all desperately need, men and women. And we are now in a situation in which more than 60% of Americans believe that sexual harassment law has gone too far because the, the, the right-wing use of it has given the impression that it applies, that it forbids all sex in the workplace. Not true. Or that it forbids all sex between so-called unequals. Not true. Or even uh, all sex outside of marriage. Certainly not true. It is, harassment is the noun, sexual is the verb. It is concerned with associations, exploitations that are not of free will that are not welcome in the, I think it's a great innovation of sexual harassment law to talk about welcome, not because consent can be coerced, but it uses a better word, welcome. And if it is welcome, it's not, you know, it's not harassment, right? And yet, it has, it is being uh, perverted and, and distorted. So I, I hope that we will hang on to the true dictionary meaning, meanings and the true uh, legal intention of the words that we need in order to have discussions in rooms like this and in order to progress with the content of those words. Um, now, the politics of feminism and celebrating diversity is the title, the subject for this evening. So I would like to start by reminding us why it is that feminism is, that, that women's movements and movements of racial and ethnic and class justice come together and why it is inevitable that they come together. Um, because I think we too often get into making laundry lists, you know, as if the uh, subjects of justice were separate, when in fact they're all linked. Be and w the, the, the deep anthropological kind of reason why they are linked is because in order to maintain, let's take racism as our most obvious division, in order to maintain racism, you have to maintain some degree of visible difference. And that means you have to control the bodies of women as the most basic means of production, the means of reproduction. It means that the bodies of white women were historically uh, protected and restricted in this nation because they were the uh, that was necessary for the maintenance of some degree of racial purity and difference. And the bodies of women of color were, on the contrary, available to both uh, white men and men of color because those bodies were assigned to producing people who were marked on their skins as cheap labor. We, we ought to recognize this, I think, easily because Historically, in our own country, miscegenation has been the most punished crime. It wasn't theft or murder or arson. It was miscegenation. And what miscegenation meant was the taking over of 
the body of a white woman, the means of production of the, quote, superior, unquote, race, by a man of color, even out of mutual choice, even out of love, it was the most historically consistently punished crime. But of course, miscegenation didn't apply the other way around. For a white man to take over the body of a woman of color, even by force, by rape, against her will, was not punished. So I think you know, we should understand the deep linkage between these two caste systems. You really can't maintain a racial caste system without controlling the bodies of women as the means of reproduction. You just can't do it. And that is why, uh, whether it is women and blacks in this country and in many other countries or women and Jews in Nazi Germany or what, you know, that these two caste systems are absolutely intertwined. It is just not possible to uproot one without also uprooting the other. I would argue anyway that it's not possible to be a feminist without being an anti-racist because most women in the world are w women of color. I mean, feminism by definition means all females, not just some females. It means all females. So on that grounds alone, one would have to be anti-racist. But I think we also need to understand the reasons why there have always been historical alliances, even if unconscious, even if only present in public opinion polls, for instance between uh, movements for sexual justice and movements for racial justice. Um, it's clear, for instance, when maybe it's more clear and looking at a distance, say, at a country like Germany between World Wars I and II, when you uh, when the, the Nazi movement, the National Socialist Movement was, was building, and you, you could see that, for instance, when Hitler was elected, and he was elected, we should remember, on a low voter turnout. <laughs> the, um, when Hitler was elected, among his very first official acts was to padlock, padlock the family planning clinics and declare abortion a crime against the state because he, the maintenance of the Aryan race required that the state control the bodies of women, not women. And he wrote this in Mein Kampf, you know. He says, when I come to power, I will put an end to the ridiculous idea that a woman's body belongs to herself. A woman's body belongs to the state. This shows you how, how, how crazy Rush Limbaugh is when he calls when he says feminazi, sort of like saying Nazi Jew, it makes as much sense. Because in fact there had been a huge feminist movement in that period, which was what the National Social Socialists were reacting against. Women had flooded into the paid labor force. There were more women in the Bundestag, the, the parliament, than in any other uh, country. Uh, there was a big gay movement. Uh, there, you know, so he, he, he was the ultra-right wing coming up against that and declaring control over women's bodies so that the Aryan race would remain pure. When it came to Jews and gypsies and the impure, they could be handled simply by uh, annihilation or by s turning them into slave labor. But you know, the bodies of Aryan women had to be put under control of the state. So I, I think we should uh, understand that the reason the politics of feminism goes with diversity is this, you know, is this kind of fundamental reason. You can't maintain those kind of strictures and lines and divisions without controlling women. And so whether whether intellectually or instinctively, these movements have always uh, come together uh, historically. 
I think there's there's another part of it uh, too, which has had been concealed uh, in what I was learning growing up, and in fact, I only began to figure it out lately. So, l let me tell you about it, just in case the same is true for you. And that is that both the uh, suffrage movement and the abolitionist, anti-slavery, anti-racist movements found a great deal of their inspiration in the native cultures, the indigenous cultures, the 500 native nations that were already here and established for millennia <laughs> before the uh, first Europeans arrived. Now, you know, I think, I, I don't know, I hope your textbooks include some of this. Mine didn't. I, only recently have textbooks included the fact that our Constitution was modeled in part after the Iroquois Confederacy, that the idea of a confederacy in which each state had particular powers, but there was an umbrella organization, uh, had come from the Iroquois, and that there were Iroquois wise men or advisors in Philadelphia to, 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 um, to instruct on how this was done, even though Benjamin Franklin and others were quite contemptuous about it. You know, they said, oh, well, if these savages, these natives can make a confederacy, so can we. But nonetheless, the, tr the, 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 uh, the connection has been admitted. But I think that um, what has been less uh, admitted or uh, recorded was what turns out to be the historical connection with the, the, the native cultures. And yet, if you think about it, where else really could there have come the deep idea and model of cultures that did not have these kind of uh, caste systems of sex and race? After all, Europeans had come here at, had begun to come here at a low point in European history when colonialism and imperialism was building up, when there had just been centuries of the murder of, of um, the burning of witches to eradicate the old pagan, non-patriarchal, non-monotheistic religion. I mean, you know, they, 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 they came here at, at, from cultures which no longer really provided much vision of the ancient way, the old equality. Uh, and here we were with uh, both women of all races and men of color considered objects. I mean, objects like tables and chairs, you know. So where did the idea come from that we could that we might look at the world as if everybody mattered, you know, that, the, that it was possible to think that, that uh, human beings were intrinsically worthwhile, that they were not all, that some of them were not born as objects and possessions. And it turns out that, that they, it, it did come in large part from the native cultures, which were places where runaway slaves found refuge, uh, there was much uh, intermarriage between the native cultures and uh, free or uh, runaway uh, slaves. The, uh, but, all, but it's also true that if you look back and read the, the suffrage literature of the time, that the, um, the early suffragists were citing as examples of egalitarianism the native cultures which were their neighbors. Remember that the, the reservation system, the apartheid system, wasn't really complete until around 1900. So there was much more contact between uh, and among the cultures. And um, you got somebody like Matilda Gage who was writing a regular newspaper about, the, uh, about native cultures as examples of female and male, of a balance between males and females, of female equality. They were being cited in international meetings by American uh, suffragists. Perhaps even simple things like the bloomer costume uh, had their origins in, 
the native cultures because there was, um, you know, there were suffragists in upstate New York sitting there at the, at the Saturday night dinner table uh, with Seneca women. I mean, there were the suffragists in, you know, 90 pounds of skirts and tight corsets and hardly able to breathe and fainting and so on. And there were women from the Seneca tribe sitting next to them in chamois tunics and uh, comfortable uh, kind of trousers and so on. And that seems to be where the, the bloomer costume originated. There, there, there are all kinds of, of uh, links and ways in which the true diversity of our culture has been subdued or even obliterated by the ways in which we have learned history. I've begun to think about vertical history. Uh, I, to st try to think about who stood on the land where we now are millennia ago. Because the standing there, the, the rocks, the earth is the same. You know, you get some kind of sense of, of connection. And this is true of indigenous cultures on many continents, not just this one. In fact, I think I'm going to make a button that's, uh, the, you know, because it's exciting to learn these things in history, but then you keep wondering, how come they never told us this? Don't you wonder that? Don't you say to yourself, you know, you read it, you, I mean, I, I was watching Amadeus and The Right Stuff on the same night on television <laughs> some years ago, and suddenly, and I thought, well, where is Nanerl Mozart? You know, she was the older sister of, of Mozart, of Amadeus, who, uh, they, and they played together, uh, you know, as musicians traveling through Europe, as children, as child geniuses. Nanerl was sent home at 16, however, to marry. And we know about her because of Amadeus writing letters to her. They were very close because they were each other's only companion, their entire isolated genius childhood, you know, and he says she was the talented one. You know, so I'm sitting there watching this movie, I think, but where is Nanero, you know? And I was thinking of it again because the other movie, The Right Stuff, uh, showed none of the dozen women who passed all the tests to be uh, in the first class of astronauts along with John Glenn, who's now being lauded over again as if, you know, he was the, the, the first astronaut. There were 12 women who qualified, in many cases, uh, more highly than Glenn and the other people who ultimately went up. There was even a, a congressional hearing about why they had been denied the right. I mean, do, do you, are you learning this? I, you know. This is the source of my button. The button is going to say, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> I know that you had Sally Ride speaking here, right? Who's wonderful. And uh, I, I took one of the first 12 women astronauts who were just forbidden you know, to, who were just washed out, to her, to Sally Ride's launch, because I was trying to get the press to admit that these women had been there. Uh, and, um, uh, and in the process, I, I was looking for one Jerry Cobb, who I think has now written a book, and it, I couldn't find her, I discovered, because she had, for all the years between the time she'd been forbidden to be an astronaut and Sally Ride's launch, which was already 20-some years, been collecting, uh, taking her own money, collecting money, buying uh, medical supplies, flying them in a single engine plane up the Amazon River and distributing them to uh, groups, you know, isolated groups there. Uh, the Jane Hart, the woman I did take, had, uh, you know, in her spare time, gone around the world in a rowboat or something. I don't know. I mean, you know, these women were still trying to be the explorers and pioneers they were born to be and yet forbidden to be. And now we've got John Glenn going again. I mean, it's very nice, but why not send Jerry Cobb, who never got to go the first time? So, <laughs> I, think, I think that um, 
the angering, but also the enormously exciting discovery of the linkage be to the necessity to diversity of feminism, the, the history that really came before, the people who stood on this ground before, is something that allows us to know it is possible. It may piss us off, and it should, because we've had such a politicized version of history given to us, even though I'm very grateful for women's history, African American history, Native American history, gay and lesbian history, everything that should be called remedial history to, in order to put the burden where it belongs. Still, we're a very long way yet from, from learning human history. But at least we can get a glimpse of the fact that it's possible. Because I think the most pernicious thing that happens to us really, as a result of the limited learning that is given to us, is that somehow we think it has always been this way, and therefore it always will be this way. Now, even if that had been true, we would change it anyway. <laughs> but it wasn't true. And in fact, in many of the native cultures, as we know, um, same-sex marriages, uh, bisexuality w w it was not only okay but celebrated. I mean, bisexuals, for instance, were thought to be twin-spirited and therefore better suited, you know, for certain roles in teaching and naming and so on because they had the wisdom of both women and men. There, the, the, it, it was possible before. We can't go backward. That's not the idea. But it does help us to know that we can learn from the past and go forward and make it possible again in a, in a different way. The diversity uh, that we celebrate, thus, is we can celebrate selfishly. We learn from it. We learn our own possibilities from it. It is in our interest as white folks you know, not to grow up believing that we are the majority in the world when we're a tiny minority, not to grow up culturally deprived, which we are, not to look around at our colleagues and students and go snow blind from the lack of, <laughs> of the beauty of different colors and shades and hues and cultures. And you, you, you know, no matter, no matter where you look, you see how we are all deprived if we are not knowledgeable of and in the presence of the full diversity of human experience. Um, here's another, here's, here's a different kind of example. The, the World Health Organization has done studies of menstruation in over a hundred and some different cultures of, um, of menopause, I mean, of menopause in, 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 you know, many, many different cultures. And they discovered how cultural, how culturally uh, sensitive what we think of as an immutable experience truly is. Because in cultures where women go from uh, more power to less power with age, like this one, there are many, many more symptoms of menopause, much more suffering, much more depression, and so on, than in cultures where women go from less power to more power. Say, in Pakistan and you know, many other cultures where women are restricted during their childbearing years and veiled and uh, kept indoors and kept, you know, be really physically restricted during those years, then when those years are over, uh, they have somewhat more freedom. You know, they can, they, age is more venerated, but also they can go out and walk in the square and perhaps not always be veiled and all this, you know, so 
it, it, menopause is, is experienced in an entirely different way. And when people come here, from women come here from those cultures, they can't believe that we are so culturally um, depressed or uh, freaked out by the whole idea of, of menopause because they see it as a positive event because they've gone from less power to more power. Now, isn't that sort of interesting? I mean, doesn't it raise all kinds of new possibilities just to think about that? So, you know, we, we need all these, we need the diversity not only of individuals but also of all these cultural experiences um, in, order, in order to learn. Um, and I think we begin to see the world in a different way. We all, each age sees the world through some kind of paradigm. You know, it's, it's the machine or it's the hierarchy or it's the... And I think that we're just beginning to, to see the world in a kind of way, I don't know how it will be described in the future. Some people s compare it to the new physics you know, so there's no, there's no hierarchy, there's no order, each thing is whirling in its place, yet there is peace. Some people uh, compare it to a whole human organism in which, which each cell plays a role. But we're beginning to get out of that old hierarch hierarchical vision and also of the old bipartite assumptions that come from dividing human nature into masculine and feminine. The idea that, um, you know, that, there, that every, every issue has two sides, that's ridiculous. You know, some issues have seven sides. Right. That come from dividing human nature into masculine and feminine. The idea that, um, you know, that, there, that every, every issue has two sides, that's ridiculous. You know, some issues have seven sides and some have 102, and some have one. You know, I mean, I think every time we f hear ourselves dividing something into only two, we ought to stop and think whether that's really accurate or not. Look how this has distorted our, our media into confrontational media. It's actually what happened to the Equal Rights Amendment in the press coverage of the Equal Rights Amendment, the federal one in the past, because the, um, uh, the, 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 the idea of objectivity in the press was that you had to have a pro and an anti. So even though the Equal Rights Amendment started out with support from 60 or 70 percent of the population, the media put on 50 percent of the time somebody saying that it would integrate bathrooms, you know, uh, legalize gay marriage, which isn't true. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had we won't wouldn't have had to work hard to do that. In addition, you know, to um, destroy Western civilization as we know it, basically. And they used to call me up and say, "Bring an anti with you." They didn't even know an anti, but they spent so much time covering the Equal Rights Amendment as if it were 50-50 that people started to wonder if maybe it wouldn't integrate bathrooms, you know, even though you could see in the states that it that had it that that wasn't the case. So I think, you know, this, this, this um, very gross notion that everything is divided into two has done us a lot of harm, not just in our in taking away from men those qualities that are wrongly called feminine and from women those qualities that are wrongly called masculine, but in our whole view of, of the world. So I hope that the, uh, the instinct, the miraculous, inexplicable instinct toward freedom and toward listening to the unique self that is born inside each one of us. Everybody who's ever met a baby knows that there's already a person in that baby, right? Um, that the lifting up of these gross, distorting, humiliating, and sometimes literally killing labels, the, see, the, the ability to see finally that there is more difference between any two men or between two women or between two African Americans or between two European Americans than there 
are between generalized group differences between women and men or between racial groups will finally allow us to see the world as if everybody mattered in all of our uniqueness and diversity and will also allow us in a kind of metaphysical way to understand that the art of behaving ethically and effectively is behaving as if everything we do matters because everything we do does matter and so it is not just a celebration of diversity on principle but out of a deep enlightened kind of selfishness and growth that will allow us to learn from each other and in the process of mattering ourselves to look at the world as if everybody mattered. Thank you. You don't have you don't have time to applaud because I took up five minutes of our organizing time. I went over five minutes. <laughs> so now it's your turn. Let's see, there are mics, I think, right? There's one here. Hello. Hello. And one on this side. Hello. Hello. But if you prefer, if it's too far to go to get to the mic, if you'd like to stand up and say your announcement or whatever, I, if everyone can't hear, I will try to repeat it. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, go ahead. In, in case of Amadeus, I think you were slightly prejudiced. They also, a great deal of time, gave to Constanza, the, the wife of the Mozart. She was a very strong woman, and she even stood to the father of the dominating father of Mozart, and she threw him out. And a great deal, she played a great deal of role of a very strong woman, and not vicious, and not malicious. Mm -hmm. And you very conveniently forgot about that part of the Amadeus. No, I, I'm glad that he had a, a wife who stood up to her father-in-law and was spirited and so on, but, Why didn't you but Nanero that? was a composer and a musician, and well, we, don't know, we, we don't know whether some of the compositions well, attributed to him were really hers. Well, it's interesting. That, that, is not the, 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 that was not my, my, my point. My point was you deliberately wanted to say that they were very prejudiced and they only showed the man there. The woman that uh, uh, Constanza played a very big role in his life. Uh, she was organizing his life. He was she was taking out the family and she stood. She stood against the domineering father who was very, very that, important in... Okay. And I'm for you men who organize women's lives, too. Well, we just, right? Yes, go ahead. Oh, that was it? Okay, no. yes. Okay. I had a question about the partial birth abortion debate that's been going on in Congress for the past year or so. Um, in case not everyone knew, it narrowly, um, Clinton's veto of the bill that was proposed was narrowly uh, upheld by only three votes. And I'm highly concerned about this entire situation and wondering what exactly is going on um, in your organizations and, and kind of what's the word out now. Um, all that the information I've received has been through news reports and so I feel I have a very skewed view of what's going on. Well, the, the, um, the groups that oppose reproductive freedom have focused on what they call the partial birth abortion, which right. is, uh, or par partial birth procedure, which is really a late-term abortion. So much that we see in public opinion polls that people believe that there are uh, 10, 20 times more of them than really exist. They're rare, they're... Um, you know, only in specific kinds of circumstances in which the woman's life fertility, you know, is endangered, which, in which the mm -hmm. child is not going to be, you know, I mean, it's a very, very limited uh, event, medical event, but it has been focused on so much mm -hmm. that it, the public dialogue is now distorted. 
the only thing that made there were only two things really that made the difference uh, that upheld the majority American view and the majority medical view that this procedure is sometimes necessary. Uh, one was Clinton's veto, and the other was that women who have had this procedure went to Washington to tell about their experiences. And it was them going, you know, from legislator to legislator. There's nothing more important than people who've really been through whatever it is telling the truth about their experience. And that's truly what made the difference. Um, but if this um, election goes the way that many are predicting it will, the, uh, the Congress will be veto-proof, and we will uh, lose even more of the right to reproductive freedom and perhaps lose it entirely. Do you think that now or other women's feminist groups in the area will have a propaganda move movement? Thus far, no money has been spent fighting this partial birth abortion, this whole thing that's been put out there by the religious mm -hmm. right and by Republicans in Congress, and no one has the information out there to counteract that. And I'm, I'm no, wondering there, if something's going to happen. There is, there, there, there is a lot of very good information uh, to counteract it, both from the medical community and from women who have had this procedure okay. themselves. And if anybody wants it here, I'll be glad to, if you just give me your name and address, I'll be glad to give it to you. But there is a, a very important coalition. It was that coalition that brought to Washington women from California and Illinois and so on who had had to have this procedure and had their lives and fertility saved by its availability. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Steinem, I was wondering if you'd tell right, me. Excuse oh. me. Yeah, okay, so th there's someone here, but why don't we take the oh, mic I'm first? Sorry. No, go that's ahead. okay. No, go ahead. She can go. Okay. <laughs> yes, the White House Project, which is organized in large part by an Iowan, Marie Wilson, who is the uh, president of the Miss Foundation for Women, but who is doing this in a, in a different capacity, is, is setting out to change consciousness about who can be president, you know? Uh, I mean, we, we've had some heroic individuals like Shirley Chisholm and Jesse Jackson and uh, Geraldine Ferraro who have helped to take the white male only sign off the White House. <laughs> but we, we still pretty much visualize a white male, don't we, when we think about who can be president. So the White House project is a big national project, something like Take Our Daughters to Work Day, you know, that is setting out to change consciousness. And it has um, made a, a pulled together lists of women who would be qualified to be president, not just women who came through the usual career paths of, of Congress and governorships and so on, but women like Wilma Mankiller, the chief of the Cherokee Nation, who's a great leader. I always say to her, you know, we should all declare ourselves, register as Cherokees and declare you president. Anyway, <laughs> so, you know, a wide variety of, of, of women uh, so that the names are out there and they're going to, in selected places, ask people as they come out of the polling booth on November 3rd to look at this ballot full of women and, and vote for one. They, it was also in Parade magazine, I think, uh, last week or the week before. It will be in other magazines. And its goal is to change consciousness enough so that by the year, uh, the election year 2008, uh, that we might actually begin to look at our whole pool of talent instead of a very, very limited pool of talent. And I think that it's present on this campus, right? There's an organizer working on this project here. Anybody want to tell how to get in touch with the uh, White House project? Do you know? I don't know. Yes. Okay, the Young Women's Resource Center in Des Moines, which is at 1909 Ingersoll Street. They have ballots there. and. Planned Parenthood also. 
So if you want to get involved with this, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It's very mind-expanding to think, you know, to, to enlarge the talent pool and think what it could be like. What would it be like if we had Maxine Waters as president? Mm. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. You, you, this, this man who ceded his place, right? Uh, yes, Ms. Steinem, I was wondering if you would uh, address what you think uh, the two or three most important issues uh, facing feminism or the feminist movement today are. And also, on a personal note, what is your proudest achievement? Hmm. I don't know if I can do the second part, so let me think about the first. Um, well, I don't, think, I, I don't think the movement is about declaring what is the most important issue, because the most important issue is the most important one that a particular woman feels. You know, so we each need to be able to to decide that for ourselves. I guess if you were to say the most important issue is the, are the ones that affect most women, just numerically, then reproductive freedom would uh, you know, come first because you know, women's reproductive role is the root cause of our uh, position, you know, the, the desire to control that role is the root cause. And also it's our most important health issue. You know, if you can't control your body from the skin in, you really can't control it from the skin out. And I would say the, 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 the second one probably is um, the double role. You know, that what, what hurts the largest number of women is that they work both inside the home and outside the home. Now, that was always true of poor women in this nation. Now it's true of middle class uh, women too, so maybe we'll do something about it. So I guess the next leap of consciousness, I would say, that we need is, uh, I mean, we, you know, from 25 years ago to now, we've convinced ourselves and the majority of the country that women can do what men can do. But we haven't convinced ourselves or the majority of the country that men can do what women can do. And until... Um, until men are raising little children, which is not a punishment, but a joy, you know, and you get to be close to your kids, and also, you know, and until men are as, as active inside the home as women are, women can't be as active outside the home as men are. So, uh, you know, I would say that probably those two things. My uh, 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 greatest accomplishment, I, I haven't a clue, you know. Uh, uh, because I don't think we know that when we're doing it. That's why we have to behave as if everything we do matters. Because we actually don't know which thing we do uh, is, is going to have an impact or be helpful to the people around us. Yeah. Um, hi, my name's Erin Hilton. I just wanted to uh, talk to you guys a little bit. Um, just this is an organizing announcement, and I noticed that a lot of people stood up um, when we started talking about voting. Um, so you've had a great discussion here, I think, of policies that you support and programs that you want to continue happening, order in Washington or in the state of Iowa. And so I know Ms. Steinem had said the only way for you to do that and to uh, make these things happen, the vehicle to do this, is to vote. And so I'm going to just tell you three ways that you can vote, and it can be easy, simple, and very. you can do this any time in the next 22 days. Um, so we have 22 days till the election. It's November 3rd. And what we're going to have here is we have absentee ballot request forms and we have early vote request forms. All that means is in the back here in the lobby and tomorrow in the union between the hours of 9 and 4, you give two addresses if you're a student, your campus address and your registration address, and we will personally mail this into your county auditor, and in the mail you'll get your ballot. So anytime within the next 22 days, you can choose to vote in the comfort of your own home without taking off work and just simply mail it back in. And the address will be on there and even your county party will come and pick this up and deliver it to the voting station. So it's very simple. The second thing was for students who are students here and want to vote for the women's amendment, that the um, Equal Rights Amendment, you can do that. If you've lived in Iowa 10 days, you can vote here in Iowa and you are legally a resident so if you'd like to change your registration, you can also do that in the back. And any uh, working moms or any other working parents that would like to um, 
take advantage of the early vote things. I'll be at the reception, and you can come to the union, and we'll also be back here. So I hope this is helpful to make things easier. Thank you. And some, someday we're going to have this, the same voting regulations in the whole nation. I mean, it's insane that it goes, each state is different, isn't it? Then we have to keep explaining and changing. Yes. Um, I have both an announcement and a question. First of all, uh, in response to the tragic beating and subsequent death of um, Matthew Shepard in Wyoming, a gay student, um, there will be a candlelight vigil Thursday night at 9.30 at the Campanile, and everyone's invited. Um, my question is, is a lot of people will equate the gay and lesbian movement to the black and women's movement. Um, I was wondering if you could address that. Some people are uncomfortable with that. Some people don't like that equation, if you mm -hmm. could talk mm -hmm. on that. Well, you know, equation doesn't mean the same, but it does mean uh, as important. You know, it does mean, I mean, they should be linked, not ranked. Do you know what I mean? The, um, and let's see if I'll try to say simply why this is especially true for the, for the women's movement. Patriarchy, pa pa patriarchal systems that control, have to control reproduction try to direct all sex into reproduction. So they try to say sex is only moral and okay if it takes place inside patriarchal marriage, so children are properly owned, you know, and is directed towards uh, having, having children. And that's basically been the message of, of patriarchal religions, and it, it still is. But, um, but this is actually a lie about human sexuality, because human beings, we think, I don't want to libel animals here, but we think that human beings are the only animals who can experience equal sexual pleasure, whether we can conceive or not. Other animals seem to have sexual desire focused in times of heat or estrus when you're most likely to conceive. Human beings don't. We can experience orgasm and sexual pleasure separate from procreation. So arguably, in real life, uh, sexuality is, human sexuality is a mark of our humanity, like our cerebral cortex, our ability to reason, to remember, and human sexuality is not only a way we procreate, but also a way we reach out to each other and communicate to each other and express love and caring and closeness and connection and intimacy. So, you know, the, the, the same forces that, that want to restrict women and restrict sex to reproduction um, are this obviously punishing uh, two men who love each other or two women who love each other. I mean, I just, once you get onto the connection, then you, it, it really helps because otherwise you wonder why the, uh, the same groups are against birth control and lesbianism. You know, you think, wait. You know, <laughs> but, but, once, but once you, <laughs> but once you understand that they're against all sexuality that is, isn't, that can't end in procreation and doesn't take place inside patriarchy. You get it, you know, you understand why the homophobic groups are also the anti-feminist groups and, you know, so on. So I, I just think we need to look at linkage always because we understand then why it is in our self-interest to be uh, part of the gay and lesbian movement, whether or not, whatever our sexuality is. You know, it's it's... It's, a, <laughs> it's in all of our, it's, they are connected and is in all of our interest. And, and on this killing that has just taken place, I, I see on television that the, um, the homophobic anti-equality groups are out in force because they're afraid that this will bring about the inclusion of, the, you know, the expanding of hate crimes. And to them, this is uh, wrong, you know, be because it, it means that you're saying that what they think is anti-family is okay, if you see what I mean. I mean, if you protect gays and lesbians as part of the hate crime legislation. So I, th I think we, if we are ever, if we're going to make this young man's death 
mean something, you know, and, and, and help other people, we really have to make sure that the law is expanded to include this kind of hate crime. Um, yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for your very thoughtful talk and uh, for all your efforts toward social justice. Uh, and I think my question kind of follows up on the last one in terms of linking different kinds of oppression. Mm -hmm. And if I understood you correctly, I think I heard you to say that uh, the bifurcation of gender has historically served as a model for other kinds of structural domination. And when I hear, often when I hear the posing of one sort of oppression as the basis for another in, um, in anything that smacks of a hierarchical mm -hmm. way, a red light goes off for me. And I suspect that that would be an oversimplification of what, or a misinterpretation of mm -hmm. what you were trying to say. So I wonder if you could expand on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to call it a model doesn't mean that it's primary. It just means that the, I mean, it, do, it doesn't, it's chickens and eggs, you know, we don't know what came first, All we don't know. All we know is that the, uh, the sexual caste system is probably the most universal. I mean, it exists, it seems, it's currently universal, not historically universal. So it, it, does, it does serve as an, as an intimate model, not to establish a high, it's not being said to establish a hierarchy, but rather to understand that if we don't have democratic families, we're considerably less likely to have democratic societies. You know, that it's in the family where we, if we grow up in a family where we think that, uh, someone we love as much as, a, as our mother is worth less than our father, or that the brother should get the education money more than the sister should, then it's created, it's dug a trench in our minds where, for the idea that some people are born more worthwhile than others, and we're more likely to accept race and class and other divisions when we get outside. But to say one is intimate is not to say that it's more important. But I'm glad for your sensitivity to, you know, because maybe model is a poor word. Yeah. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, I first want to thank you, Ms. Steinem, also for this uh, wonderful discussion. I particularly enjoyed how you linked women's issues with all other kinds of diversity issues and how these really shouldn't be separate. Um, I also had a kind of a call to arms locally here uh, at the university and then a question. Um, I would like to say that uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the September 29th movement is still alive. Uh, we're still very active on this campus and I want to make it, uh, I guess, just a statement about the movement. Despite what you may have heard, despite how we're portrayed, we're not about just one issue, not just about Carrie Chapman, Cat Hall. We're about underfunded multicultural programs. We're about LGTB issues. We're about pretty much anything the administration, we feel the administration has nickel and dimed us on, and we want to take this administration to task on these issues and stand up. Let us not forget that just a year and a half ago, eight members of the student body were brought up on charges of boisterous expressions of free speech on a college campus. And we really shouldn't forget that and forget who we are as students on this campus and just take that line down. So I would encourage everybody here, since you obviously care about women's issues and these are all linked to diversity issues, to get involved with the movement. You can talk to Alyssa Storr, the woman who introduced our speaker, Ms. Steinem, tonight, uh, to get involved in the 929. And this kind of leads me to my question, Ms. Steinem. Uh, with my experience with the September 29th movement and our dealings with the administration, I've found that often we've been portrayed and cast by the positions of power as one group, that our diversity has been divided. You know, we were, we were treated as first an African-American group, even though our organization was 100 times more diverse than the people we were dealing with. We were shown only as uh, a certain group of people, and I was wanting to ask your advice on how to deal with that kind of characterization, how to deal with the co-opting of our diversity by uh, mm -hmm. people in power. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need to um, invent words and symbols that say simply uh, 
diversity. You, you know, I mean, in South Africa, uh, for a while they talked about the rainbow, you know, and here too we've used the rainbow coalition and so on. I think we, we need to um, put the shoe on the other foot, you know. Um, uh, I mean, we were talking at dinner about bilingualism. We ought to talk about monolingualism, you know, which is the curse which bilingualism should have, bilingual education should have been uh, presented to cure, you know, just because then it would have made a broader coalition around it. Um, we, we hear about underdeveloped countries, but we are an overdeveloped country, you know, in which one in three folks gets cancer, one in three, because of our overdevelopment. We just, I just think we need to, I guess what I'm saying is we need to seize the power to name ourselves. So that, because otherwise in a vacuum, the other side will characterize us uh, wrongly. Yeah. Um, in the interest of diversity, I'd like to ask a question that not a, probably not a lot of th people think about. Um, my, what I'm going to school for and what I hope to do is fashion design. Um, I've come up with a thousand reasons why that's something I shouldn't do, um, particularly the fashion industry because it uh, je objectifies women's bodies because of eating disorders. Um, I'm asking um, selfishly uh, if you could offer a few suggestions, um, not reasons not to do it, but maybe suggestions uh, as I do to um, keep in mind feminism and keep in mind mm -hmm. that I want to portray a feminist image even mm -hmm. as I do do this thing. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's great because I think it's great to take a field that has been devalued mm -hmm. and say, wait a minute, you know, here's what it can be. Um, yeah. I think it's useful to think about style rather than fashion mm -hmm. because fashion is connotes something dictated from outside. Style is the expression of inside. So style can be, help us to see our, our diversity and individuality. Um, we used to have a column in um, Ms. Magazine from time to time called How to Have Fun Though Dressed, <laughs> which was trying to, <laughs> trying to take this, this attitude, you know, to get out from under the, the commercialism and consumerism and see it as, uh, as self-expression. Right is painting on the canvas of your body, of expressing yourself. There was a, a wonderful black American designer named Patrick Kelly, who is no longer with us, unfortunately. He, he, he died of AIDS, a wonderful designer. And he, 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 was, uh, he was actually the only American designer, I think, accepted into the French, whatever the French high fashion haute couture mm -hmm. institute mm -hmm. is. Uh, and he had a great spirit, you know, because he was determined that he was never going to create something that his sisters and his mother, uh, who were big women, you know, couldn't wear. So he used all these wonderful stretch fabrics and he celebrated bodies with, you know, plump, big women's bodies with tight clothes, you know, because why not, you know, and he put buttons and cheap buttons and bows in a way that looked beautiful and you didn't need expensive jewelry. It, it was as if, he had defeated the whole purpose of the fashion industry, which is usually to divide, to say, I'm richer than you, you know, and turned it over to say, um, to unite, you know, to say, we can all wear this and it looks different on everybody and that's great. So I think, yes, I mean, be, be, a, be a designer. I think uh, <laughs> 7th Avenue definitely needs you, there's no doubt. <laughs> I think the same thing. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've just got uh, a little bit of a confusion issue, I guess. I'm just a little bit confused. You'll have to forgive me. I'm, I'm only a man. Uh, but, um, and the whole pain in menopause uh, versus power in Pakistan and the United States, um, I'm of the opinion and I've, I've been told anyway that, and this may be due to right-wing conspiracists, but um, that women in Pakistan really don't have near the power that, that women in the United States have, nowhere near. Um, and 
And also then to look at that and say, you've kind of chosen the lesser of two evils. The women in Pakistan uh, were very much, you said that they gained power as they grew older, but were, but were very controlled as they were younger, where the reverse happens in the United States, and you've kind of lauded the one system, which is kind of the lesser of the two evils, uh, while evil, you know, you would say that to have them being ruled over like that while they're young, of course, would still be wrong. Um, and I'm just a little bit con confused on that. And then also the fact that uh, then if, if the power issue is set aside, um, then what we wear, what women wear, would cause less pain in menopause. I think you've uh, failed to take into account maybe somewhere around 112 different factors, such as diet, exercise, and many other things that mm -hmm. take place that would, that would deal with menopause. And then that also makes me think that you may have contradicted yourself in putting an argument into two sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> when really there may be 112 different well, first, issues. First of all, for, yeah, first of all, I would never say only a man. You're fully a person. <laughs> but um, you're right, I was only taking one element there, which is the cultural element. Of course there are physical elements, diet elements, you know, I mean, there are a thousand different elements. But it's... It, it, but to compare those two cultures is illuminating without saying, I'm not saying one is better than the other. Uh, what I'm saying is that each, uh, that it's illuminating to look at the comparison, that you learn, each can learn from the other. Because in this culture, to the extent that the cultural element of menopause is crucial, women go, tend to go from uh, less uh, from more power, youth, to less power in age, whereas but, but still women more in power other than they have in Pakistan in that old age. But hopefully, so we still have more power but, at an older age. No, no, no. But in the, it, it's but if you're living in Pakistan, you don't experience the United States. You experience Pakistan, and if you're living in the United States, you experience it. So, it's the comparison is of two discrete experiences each pivotal, pivot, pivoting on power, but not to say that one culture is better than the other. On the contrary, I hope that one day we will be powerful throughout our lives. So we won't go either from more to less or less to more. We'll be powerful, men and women will be powerful throughout our lives. But it still makes me think that you're using a culture where, wrong, where bad things are happening to make a point to better yeah, I am using a, a culture where bad things are happening. I'm saying that, that it, when it goes from, from bad to slightly less bad, it makes a difference. Okay, but it's still bad. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I was, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on a movement slash concept, uh, ecofeminism, and maybe your enrollment in it or membership mm -hmm. in it or any kind of... No, I, I think that, that uh, ecofeminism is um, an exciting, emergent uh, body of thought, uh, which is the, uh, which takes the old pairing of women and nature from a negative point of view and says, uh, you, you know, that, that, that patriarchal structures have placed a premium on conquering women in nature. And this has given women a feeling of connection to nature, which has a positive side, which, they, which can be used. I think the, the, um, the, the other school of writing and thought that is similar is, deep, is called deep ecology, you know, because there are men that are writing this way too. And I would say the difference between traditional environmental thought and both deep ecology and ecofeminism is that in traditional thought, it, it was still more um, centered on, it was more protectionist. It was more saying, I am a powerful person protecting the rainforest. And in ecofeminism and deep ecology, it's more, I am part of the rainforest protecting myself. You know, it's seeing the linkage. 
uh, it's not seeing people as separate from nature, but seeing it as a, as a continuum. Maybe there's someone here who has a better way of, of defining this difference, if so, say so. But that's, I mean, in reading and so on, that seems to me to be the difference. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 1992 was entitled the Year of the Woman, and uh, two of the most prominent elections that year were Carol Mosley Braun in Illinois and Barbara Boxer in California. Um, this year, they're both up for re-election, and a poll coming out yesterday has Mosley Braun down by 10 points and Boxer down by four. I was wondering if you thought that the fact that their seats are in peril maybe due to the Clinton fallout or possibly a, just a failure of their feminist agenda? Mm. Um, first of all, I wouldn't call it the year of the woman. I mean, that was the, what the press called it, you know, but uh, because the actual increase was the same over time, it's just that it was more in, in one election cycle and then less in the next, but it came out to be the same. But anyway, um, no, I think, I think that their, actually their situation is typical and it would be probably true almost regardless of what they did or regardless of Clinton, although I'm not trying to do a single factor analysis here, but all I can say is that it follows a very familiar pattern, which is that, uh, which was always clear among women in state legislatures, and it went like this, and also in Congress, isn't women, a woman would get elected almost by accident, for instance, women were quite likely to get elected in districts controlled by the opposition party because the, uh, the, the other, their party didn't put up a man because they thought it was impossible. So, they would, so that by accident almost, there would be a woman who, who won. This happened to, to Patricia Schroeder in the first election too. She, she, nobody thought the seat could be won, so they let her run she won without the support of the party at all, just with community groups. And then as in her, after she'd been in Congress one term, the entire patriarchy ran against her, it seemed. Her own party put up a former astronaut against her, I think, and the, uh, the Republican Party put up an athlete, or maybe it was, it was like the jockocracy was all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she narrowly won. So, you know, there, there, there is a, a pattern out there that says that women are most likely to win in races where the race is thought to be impossible, which was clearly true for Carol Mosley Brown, for instance. Um, and then they are mo more likely than, than a male politician to be knocked off after only one term. It's like they win by accident and then the forces come and zap them, you know, afterwards. Now, you know, this is not the only reason, obviously, um, you know, people both have made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. There was there were huge expectations, especially of Carol Mosley Brown as the first African American woman in the Senate. Um, you know, there's there are a lot of par particu particular things, but there's also a familiar pattern here. You you know, we get in power almost by accident, and then there's a big attempt to knock us off. It's 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 why uh, it's not just women, but any out group. You know, so uh, it, you know it's why uh, out groups are less likely to serve a long time in the same seat. You know, it's it's a pattern, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah. just so I'm clear, so you think that the establishment in Washington inherently does not want women in power? No, uh, yeah, that's true. But I'm thinking about the establishment in California and in Illinois when I say that. I see. Thank you. When yeah. did you uh, become a member of the women's rights? Well, I wish I'd become smart when I was as young as you, but I got to tell you <laughs> that I didn't. You're, you're going to do much better because you're smarter younger. <laughs> and for me, it was only when I was in my early 30s or mid-30s that I began to understand that there was a reason why I w identified with every out group in the world. You know, I was part of an out group, but I mean, I didn't understand that. There was no women's movement when I was growing up. 
at, or at least if there was, it was so small that you know it wasn't a public presence. So it wasn't until I was much older than you, and I'm so glad you have a head start. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Earlier you were talking about how uh, people have to realize that men and women are equal. How do you, how can you teach equality without neglecting diversity? Well, e uh, equality doesn't mean sameness. Uh, it means it means um, it means uh, to take an image. It means listening. It means listening with the same care and and openness. Uh, but you're going to hear different things from each person, if you know what I mean. But it may, but you have the same. But each person has the same right to be heard. So uh, equality and diversity are are not um, incompatible. On the con on the contrary, I think one is necessary for realizing the other. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yes. I would like to know how you became a member of the women's rights movement. Well, um, it isn't like something you become a, a member of exactly, although you may join an organization. For, for me, it was, uh, I was a writer. I'd been a writer for magazines for quite a while. And uh, I went to cover um, a hearing at which a lot of women who say so this was in New York State, and the New York this was a long time ago, and the New York State Legislature had held hearings on abortion, and they invited, I think, uh, ten women and uh, ten men and one nun to testify. <laughs> so, a bunch of of early feminists in New York, they all met in a church basement, and they invited everybody. And they said, well, you know, we think you should hear from the women who've had this experience. So I just went as a reporter to cover this hearing. And for the first time in my life, I heard women stand up in public and tell the truth about how they felt and what they had experienced, as if it were serious what women experienced. And I was just blown away by that. And, uh, you know, and I realized... Um, that it, you know, it connected to my experience. So I think it, it's, it's something, it's like when something inside you speaks and someone else hears it and, or somebody else says something and you think, oh, I thought only I felt like that. And you realize if two unique people can f be having these kinds of experiences that probably there's a something political going on, and if you get together, you can fix it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Steinem. Thank you for coming to Iowa State. Um, as a fellow writer, well, this is a two-part question. I was wondering where you see the future of Ms. going into the millennium, and also I was wondering about your thoughts on the resurgent, well, it's kind of like the birth of the strong woman role in like movies and music and other forms of media. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's nice that you ask about Ms. because we are just, see if I can explain this. I have not tried to explain this simply. In this <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're just in the process of buying it back. I mean, it, it it for the last 10 years has been owned by other people. We, the, the, its staff has controlled it editorially, but it has actually been owned by editorially, but it has actually been owned by other companies. Uh, and we've always wanted to buy it back, but you know it's a long story. But anyway, so now for a series of reasons, we we were um, able to do it, and I've just spent the last six weeks or so raising the money. And and you know what made the difference? It is so interesting how something that you know intellectually, yeah, the journey from your head to your heart, you know, is. I, I've been writing about groups of women who invest money or who contribute money that are new networks of women seizing control of sometimes inherited wealth, some, you know, often inherited wealth that has gone through the men, you know, has gone, has been given, if 
if the family had the misfortune of not having a son, it went to a son-in-law, you know, it never went. <laughs> and so they, they've been um, seizing control of this. And what made the difference is that these women now exist and are there to invest. So for the first time in the 27 years of Ms. Magazine's life, the uh, financial interest, which used to be advertising, we used to have to try to get advertising, which was extremely difficult to do since we don't do recipes to get food ads and fashion stuff to get, you know, and all that. The, uh, and then it was with kind of inhospitable owners. So for the first time, the uh, financial part of the life of the magazine and the editorial mission will be going in the same direction instead of like this. And it's very exciting to, to think what what can be done. That's you know, really good to hear. It's going to become, I think, a little media company, you know, because, <laughs> uh, you know, not instead of being uh, bar barely struggling along as, as, as a magazine. And what was the second part of your question? Um, just it, in during the 90s, um, there's been like the strong women role in uh, mainly movies and music. Just what do you think? You're thinking of like a role model. I mean, music. I mean, the Lilith Fair, all the great yeah, you the, know women the, in music. I, I know what you mean, but in movies, there's not so many, are there? Uh, what are you thinking well, of? Well, there there are like about three or four movies a year that you know all the critics always <laughs> say that provides a strong role model for uh, you know young girls and adolescents. Uh, adolescents, and I was just wondering about your thoughts on that. If that, mm -hmm. like, if you feel that does affect, you know, oh yes, the youngest woman of God, America. No, I mean, you know, it has it has a huge impact on us what we see in the movies. You know, it's it, it, it's terribly, terribly important. Um, we we grow up with this kind of media sickness almost that says that what we see on the screen and in on the television and in newspapers is more real than we are. So if we see uh, diminished roles there, or, we s or else we're totally absent, you know, if our racial group or experience is absent, we feel invisible. It's absolutely crucial that we see a true diversity of, you know, ourselves on the screen. Um, you know, Suzanne Langer, you know, the, the philosopher, I mean, she was a... See, here's another history thing. Big time heavy hitter American philosopher that we don't know. But anyway, who, who died not so long ago. She used to say that each art form had inherent in it a s sense of time. So books were time past. You could fight it, but still, books were time past. Um, plays were time present. And movies are dreams time less, and that's what gives them their power. So we, we need those images. Our dreams need those images. Thank you. Before you are hauled off to Brunier Gallery for your next appointment, could I point out that the media has criticized leaders of the feminist movement for not commenting on this present scandal in the White House. Would you care to address mm -hmm. yourself to that t subject, including the participants in the Congress and the media itself. Yeah. Where? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It comes. The sound I'm not comes big at you as you? if you can't tell where it's coming from. Oh. The, um, yeah, that's an easy question. Actually, we've been we've been commenting. The the women in the women's movement have been commenting up the gazoo. It's just that we aren't saying what they want us to say. So they. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, I've written in the New York Times about it. I've been interviewed endlessly about it. Everybody has. But the, the uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's been a, a single standard. And uh, let me see how I can express it most easily. Well, do you remember a man named Bob Bauman? who was a congressman, Bob Bauman from Maryland, who was this very, very, very right-wing congressman who was like Bob Dornan East, you know? <laughs> uh, he, was, he was accused of having an affair with an 18-year-old congressional page, male. And at the time, the press, uh, you know, said to us, oh, what's of it, you know, and we said, well, but the question is, was it consenting or not? 
Because if it was welcome sex, it's not our business. Now, you know, he, he was so homophobic and crazy that he was, ended up getting diselected because, it, you know, so, but that was due to his hypocrisy, not due to his homosexuality. There are, you know, Barney Frank, there are other people who have been honest and remained in Congress. Uh, and I think that same standard applies to Clinton. You know, um, is it dumb and stupid and is he a sex addict, as Bella Abzug said before she died? You know, but maybe, I don't know. But if, it's, if it wasn't harassment, it wasn't forced, it wasn't, but you know, it's, it's, it's not against the law. But what, what um, disturbs me most actually is what's happening to Monica Lewinsky. It is outrageous that a young woman, it doesn't matter whether you like her or dislike her, this young woman has not broken any law and she was held incommunicado by the FBI and Kenneth Starr without a lawyer for hours. I think a lot of hours, wasn't it? Eight or nine hours, something like that. Ten. And she was forced to testify about her most intimate life uh, by threat of imprisonment, not just of her, but of her mother. She is now an international symbol and joke. People are making jokes about her appearance and her weight and so on. I mean, it's a wonder this woman is still alive. And, you know, that is the most distressing to me. Not that, I mean, we've commented up the gazoo about Clinton, uh, and I think what's so annoying to the ultra-right wing is that feminist opinion is the same as majority American opinion in the polls, and they're just angry that they, <laughs> they can't, you know, convince the majority to think the way they think and use words like adultery. I mean, I thought, you know, it's like the ayatollahization or something of, of the... <laughs> of of the nation and, and of the media. Uh, but, but what concerns me too is that not only are we not being heard in what we're actually saying about the president because they think we should say something else, but also that our defense of Monica Lewinsky is not being heard. I mean, it's, it's outra I mean, put yourself in her place. It is outrageous, isn't it? I mean, the, the only person I think who who has suffered even a modicum in recent times, as she has, is the guy who dropped the baseball or who failed to pick, what was his name? In, who's, being, who's being punished, you know, in, much, in somewhat the, sa the same way, who's become an international joke, and I mean, for one mistake? Well, anyway, um, I hope that whatever we can do to empathize and understand what a travesty of justice this is, you know, that we will do. Uh, well, I didn't mean to end on that, but then we all seem to be ending on that <laughs> later. So um, I really, I want to thank you for, for taking time to come here. And I don't know, do you all know each other? <laughs> I always worry about that. Okay, well, here's, here's the last part of my my bargain. Uh, if you came here, you probably, we probably share, all of us share some interests and concerns and so on. So on your way out, find four people you don't know, introduce yourselves, say what you're doing, what you care about. Um, you, you know, you can skip right past the first six weeks of lunches, you know, and say what's in your heart. <laughs> and, and, uh, and maybe you'll leave here with a new subversive colleague, a new uh, job, a new friend, a new love affair. I mean, you know, who knows what could happen. <laughs> because truly, this is about making our lives better in every way and reaching out to each other as a community and realizing that the energy that is in this room can really, really, really change the world in ever increasing concentric ripples. So let's start with us. Thank you.